Good afternoon to everyone. We are coming to the closing panel of this year's Open Science Conference. The panel is about the reform of research assessment in the spirit of open science. The uh, intention, the aim of the panel is to reflect advancements in reforming research assessment in the context of open science. As you know, in um, uh, science we were measuring very much um, indicators or scientific outputs by indicators like for example the age index. Now we want to get rid of it. We also want to include more qualitative indicators to uh, um, measure scientific performances. And an important and most recent activity in this context is QUARA, that is the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment. That is an initiative very much driven by the European Commission to form a legal entity which includes stakeholders from all around Europe, from all the different groups like um, um, publishers, funders, research performing organizations, infrastructure, service information, organizations to uh, um, jointly develop a new uh, um, uh, well system to assess the uh, um, uh, research performance of um, uh, individuals and I also hope of institutions. During the panel we want to discuss um, uh, with the panelists and we have four of them and you and the participants the question do these efforts on uh, reforming research assessment also bring a push for open science and open practices? You can all ask your questions via the Q&A tool, which you already know from the previous uh, presentations. And then uh, um, here is it again. So you can either scan the QR code or uh, um, uh, use the access code at slido.com and um, uh, enter your post, your questions there. And um, I will then uh, um, choose them here with my iPad. We have four panelists uh, representing uh, different uh, stakeholder groups. And I think they are all here already. There they are. Very warm welcome from uh, my side. I would like to briefly introduce you all to our audience. And I start with you, Lydia. Lydia is the Secretary uh, General of Science Europe. Uh, that is the association uh, representing major public organizations uh, that fund and perform excellent uh, groundbreaking research in Europe. And before that, uh, and this is where we got to know each other, she worked uh, for the European University Association. She brings the perspectives of funders on the one side and also from uh, the universities because, as I mentioned, she was um, working for the EUR, the European University Association, earlier. Then we have Ian, um, uh, who you already know from uh, the uh, opening uh, speech on day one. He's uh, working with uh, PLOS. There he is responsible for uh, the open research solutions at PLOS. He leads the program of activity that aims to increase adoption of open science practices and increase the benefits of adopting open science. He brings in the perspective of a publisher. Then we have uh, Claudia Lavish. Um, Claudia is to me the most knowledgeable person in uh, European science policy because she has been working in Brussels since 1996. She uh, is with us in the Leibniz Association with our European office in Brussels since 2007 and since 2008 she is the head of the office. The Leibniz Association is a member in Quara and uh, so Claudia brings in the perspective of a research performing organization. And finally, we have Iris from Amsterdam. Welcome. She brings in the perspective of an early career scientist. So uh, Iris is a PhD candidate at the philosophy department of the Free University in Amsterdam. So you see these are the four um, uh, stakeholder groups which are represented here in the panel. And um, the idea is uh, that Lydia gives an impulse talk uh, around about 10 minutes, uh, Lydia, so that we have in enough and sufficient time for the discussion. And the purpose of the talk is to uh, like bring us uh, at the same level of information about Aquara, what is its current status and what is recent progress. So uh, Lydia, about 10 minutes uh, for your initial talk here in the panel. We cannot hear you at this point in time. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. 
And you see the screen in full display? We don't see the slides yet. Yes, now we see the slides. Everything okay. is working fine. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to thank you, Klaus, for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor for me to be uh, in, in this uh, dialogue and being part of, of your very important conference that you have consistently done over the years. So I'm speaking here uh, today from Science Zero perspective perspective and avoiding lay because uh, I am Secretary General representing research funding and research performing organizations across Europe, but I am mostly here representing the CoRS steering board of which I am part of. That was the result of an election that took place in December uh, 2022. So I will structure my talk in three parts. Uh, first of all, a short description on the agreement. I'm sure you have all seen it, but I will just um, briefly mention the main principles. Um, a, a short information on the coalition itself and how, how it is working. And then I will make a first few links uh, because we have a very young life as Coara between Open Science and Coara and also with DORA because many people ask us what is the link between Coara and DORA. So we have developed a, a first um, overview of that. And of course, I will then leave you with uh, useful web links. I will not stop in every sentence of every slide I have prepared, otherwise I would take more than 10 minutes. So I will just uh, mention the most relevant or important aspects in my understanding of every slide. So let's start with the agreement. Uh, the agreement was uh, came about by, yes, initially, the initiative of science of the European Commission, sorry, who approached both the European University Association and Science Europe to help them in drafting the agreement. That was the, um, they just finished the report that they published in December 2021, uh, where they interviewed more than 300 uh, institutions across Europe about the, the thoughts on, uh, on the, and the needs for a reform of research assessment. And they build on the knowledge that both organizations, Science Europe and uh, EUA, have or had at that time on research assessment because we both had done kind of parallel studies addressing our communities, our membership organizations. So the conclusion was that indeed we should take account of all the most recent developments in the area, namely DORA, Leiden Manifesto, Hong Kong Principles, etc. Bring this all together and move forward with um, actionable um, principles or commitments. So that's what we did. We published the agreement on 20th of July. This is an overview of the process. As I said, we started in, um, in January 2022. In fact, we put together uh, through a call uh, more than 300 uh, universities and research organizations and a group of 20 experts that um, we, cons we were consulted with uh, regularly. That gave rise to the agreement that was published on 20th of July last year. The uh, agreements are consist of four core commitments. These are the essential. These are the what we want to achieve. And with these commitments, we want to recognize a larger diversity of contributions uh, out, as an outcome of the research and as an input to the research to adapt them to the current situation, uh, decrease the weight of quantitative indicators in the assessment of research and instead move towards more qualitative assessment criteria, abandon the inappropriate use of uh, journal impact factors, H index and other uh, typical metrics uh, today, and also avoid the use of rankings in research organizations. This was the, with the intention to make uh, a, a fairer system or bet, or recognizing better the new types of outputs that are being generated nowadays. Then we have six supporting commitments. These are aimed to indicate how we want to do it. So how we want to do it, first of all, we need resources. Institutions need to dedicate resources, need to, uh, need to assess uh, or critically assess, look at their criteria, raise awareness in all communities, exchange practice with others, uh, with other stakeholders and other researchers, community progress, and last but not least, constant engage in a constant evaluation of uh, research assessment exercises while making these results openly available. The main time frame, uh, main lines uh, for to implement these commitments were that by 
uh, year one after the signature of an organization, that organization has started or significantly enhanced the process to review uh, their um, assessment criteria and processes. And by year five, these organizations can demonstrate uh, substantial uh, progress. So as you can see, the agreement is just a starting point, is uh, to be fully developed and implemented by the members of the coalition. At that point, the Commission has retired, the European Commission has retired from the front line and is the steering board together with the members of the coalition that take over all these processes. Most uh, public research organizations or private uh, public or private uh, par private public partnerships can sign the um, the agreement, even organizations without legal personality. So, following the publication of the agreement, uh, the Commission helped us putting together that coalition to give a structure into the dialogue between research uh, stakeholders. Uh, with the vision to uh, implement uh, the commitments that is recognizing the diversity of outputs and methodologies and practices to maximize the quality and the impact of research and with the mission to enable a systemic reform for research assessment. This is why the COARA is focusing on institutions because we believe that the institutions can have a lot to say in driving this change in full use of their scientific knowledge and autonomy while being in coordination with others. Uh, today, uh, one week ago, on 20th of June, uh, we have 504 uh, research organizations that have signed uh, the agreement. And uh, you can see, I leave the, here the distribution uh, of countries um, of these 504 member organizations. There are big countries like Spain, Italy, Poland, France, and Europe that have signed uh, the agreement. But yes, indeed, many organizations are from Europe, which is not our aim. Our aim is to Pohara to become a really international organization. And we have plans for uh, expanding our remit to other regions uh, in the world. Um, this organization has a general assembly, all members are represented, has a steering board, which is elected, that's where I am far from, with 10 other colleagues, and it has um, a president and two vice one chair and two vice chairs. These are us. And then we are now implementing uh, the work of the association through a series of what we call working groups. These are self organized uh, structures, so universities, research centers come together, making a proposal on what they think they can develop together. Uh, the first uh, batch of um, applications was received by June 6, and we are now as a um, uh, steering board assessing them all, and soon we will announce who are the, uh, the working groups that are going to receive uh, approval, not only that, some funding for them to implement their activities. Next to the working groups, and as a result of a spontaneous movement within certain countries in Europe, there's what we call the national chapters. These are not necessarily OARA structures in the sense that is uh, stakeholders themselves in a certain country that have decided to come together. So we have decided to embrace that and to give a space for national chapters so that they can be connected with uh, the Koara working groups and with the Koara dialogue uh, in um, in the organization. There is a secretariat currently operated by the European Science Foundation, Science Connect, which is helping to uh, organize all this together with some in-kind support by the European Commission, Science Europe, uh, the University of uh, the Netherlands, and the Young European Research Universities uh, Network. Now. Going to the subject of today's uh, meeting, uh, links between CoR and open science. As I said, we don't have a long history, so that we don't have a lot of substance for reflection, but we do have uh, some principles underpinning our activities. One is, of course, that CoR is uh, fully defending open science. That's the way forward. And not only that, that the reform of the research assessment is a precondition for open science to become a reality. To, recognize uh, all those outputs that nowadays are not recognized as they should and that are 
fair contributions to science because they are done under rigorous academic uh, and scholarly uh, methodologies. The, um, in, in, in doing so, open science, the same as the inclusion of young researchers, has been included as a condition for all working groups to tackle when they propose the actions that they are going to, to develop. I, we believe that only uh, doing this, we are going to achieve uh, the truly uh, systemic change. And then the last part of my talk, as I said, is what are the links between Koara and DORA? So you can see in this graph, uh, these uh, circles, the uh, uh, left circle on DORA, the right circle on Koara, and the part where they intersect the most. As you know, the DORA principles are principles. Uh, it's about exp making explicit the hiring criteria, take responsibility for uh, authorship and publisher practices and responsible metrics, etc. Whereas Quara is more about prioritizing qualitative evaluation rather than quantitative, avoiding the use of rankings, uh, committing resources to continuously assess the um, practices to see if there is a need for review. So it is a very dynamic process. It's part of a community. It's part of a worldwide movement. And what we have most in common indeed is the abandon, the, the poor or limiting use of uh, journal metrics and uh, value the broader range of contributions. So what Koara brings into the system today is an organization, is a capacity to act in coordination with other research organizations all across the world. And I think that with this, I leave you with useful links. I'm sure that the presentation will be made available to you. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lydia. That was a perfect introduction to uh, this panel. You already addressed um, the link to uh, um, open science, but also to related activities, because indeed, Quara or the th ideas behind Quara are not really new. We had already lively discussions on alt metrics to monitor or report on the attention of uh, scientific outputs or, or the uh, former open science policy platform. Uh, they published their view on uh, next generation metrics related to open science that took place already in 2017. And I think even at this conference here, we had a presentation about uh, the outcome of these expert groups. Now I would like to, to ask Iris um, uh, from Amsterdam. You are an early career researcher working on uh, criteria for good universities. Do you see a contribution to uh, from uh, Quara to um, criteria you consider to be uh, necessary for a good university? Yeah, thanks for the question and also thanks for inviting me to be part of this <coughs> panel. very nice to be here to, to talk about this important topic as an early career researcher. And I think, um, yeah, research assessment and, and the Quara initiative, I think is very important because um, if you talk about good universities and what's seen as a good university, we tend to think, for example, of Ivy League universities, Oxford, Harvard, um, uh, Cambridge, like the English universities. But then thinking about what, what are universities doing, for example, for research assessments, um, I think that should also be a criteria for good universities. So advancing careers in a more fair way can definitely be a way uh, forward to also see what is a good university. And Lydia, you have been involved in uh, these activities all also in your earlier position uh, when you were at EU. Uh, where do you see the major difference of advancements, uh, of the advancements we have now as compared to what we did in 2017, for example? Absolutely, absolutely. The, um, I think that the level of awareness um, even if we complain that it's not uh, not only um, researchers are aware of this, but the level of awareness, the quality of the discussions we had when while we were building the agreement, it was fantastic. Uh, we had general assemblies with 200, 250 people. Uh, we divided into very effectively into work uh, parallel sessions. We got very different angles and perspectives, but 
yes, they were different, but at the same time, they had a common line, and and it, that was what it was very useful to draft the commitments. So I think that the, the level of maturity in the sector is is much greater now than it used to be, of course, in 2017 or 18. Yes. And Ian, how is that perceived from the perspective of a funder? A publisher or a funder? Uh, oh, excuse me, publisher, yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Um, so ju just to clarify the question, is this still about development since 2017 or, 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 the, or a broader question? Uh, the question is, uh, how do you perceive the Quara development, the recent development of Quara, not necessarily back to uh, 2017? Uh, well, certainly, um, I welcome it both personally and because I represent a, a publisher that uh, was one of the early signatories and implementers of DORA, the, the Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, there have been, for years, decades even, I think, um, initiatives, um, opportunities to, to try and broaden our view of what quality research looks like. We've had journals that have welcomed all kinds of research results, regardless of their perceived interest or impact. But many of those, um, many of those journals or other solutions that have tried to address that problem have have failed. Um, and mm. there may be various individual circumstances, but I do think that reflects the fact that it's not just about providing a new tool or a new solution. It's about thinking about the whole system and all stakeholders, funders, researchers, publishers, institutions. Um, and I think that the um, the way in which Coir has been presented, and by the way, I think that Venn diagram is fantastic, um, really, really useful. I, I will be reusing that a lot in terms of um, how Coir and Dora intersect and what they're focusing on. Um, so I think there is a I think it's a really valuable European and increasingly it seems global um, voice um, on on this problem, and, I, and it it really um, aligns with um, some of the work that we're doing specifically at PLOS, but also I think gives uh, I think more specifically it helps us give more attention on meta research on, re on research mm -hmm. on research and sort of helping us really think about the evidence about um, how these systems work and and what the opportunities are for improvement. Um, I could say more specifics, but I'll pause because I'm sure other people have opinions. But thank you for the question and, and thanks for the opportunity to be, to be part of this discussion today. The Quara initiative um, is very much driven by the European Commission. And I now look to you, uh, Claudia, because you are most familiar with all the European science policy processes. <coughs> I still remember when it kicked off, everybody was not really shocked, but um, you know, was um, hesitating uh, um, um, and um, uh, alerted because we perceived it as yet another initiative from the Commission which Im is imposing on uh, the research organizations or the researchers, unlike, for example, the open science movement, which was very much a bottom-up movement. We now see, and Lydia um, addressed that in her presentation, that, um, well, we have some uh, uh, some yeah, um, um, overheads in terms of organizational frameworks, um, uh, for example, Quora, like for example, also the, the European Open Science Association has a um, uh, general assembly, a steering board, a secretary, a president, vice president. So uh, um, an issue could be that uh, the, uh, such organizations rather deal with um, uh, like organizational issues and not so much with the real content. So. Um, Claudia, what's your uh, opinion on that? Yeah, thank you, Klaus, and also thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure for me to to participate in in that debate. Well, I think it's well, it's true that Quara, as being part of the era policy agenda, is of course an in the first place, an initiative of the European Commission. Although I would like to remind that in its council conclusions from December 22, it, were, it was the EU member states who invited the European Commission to initiate a reform and a, a process on, on research assessment in the EU, and in particular with regard to open science. So that claim was directly linked to, to all with regard to, to open science. Um, so, 
so yes, it's it's EU driven, but but it's also member states driven. Um, and on the other hand, it's also true that if we want to make a decisive step forward in the near future, we must overcome isolated initiatives at national level, at European level, and even at the international le level, and try to bring them all together. And by the way, this is also something uh, that uh, was a result of the report of the Open Science Policy Platform that has been published in um, in 2020. Um, so, and as to as regards the bureaucracy and the burden, I think at some point we need a structure. We need a structure if we want to to overcome um, individual. Uh, initiatives and this attempt is quara mm -hmm. and so far i can say that um i think that it is working at low level low profile as good as it can um and i cannot see i mean it is a structure like any association like the leibniz association with the general assembly and this structure also provides the opportunity uh, to uh, it offers the opportunity for the scientific community to have a say in this process because the general assembly is composed of scientists of the organizations and their scientists and so is the the steering mm. board of quara let's ask our scientists our early career <laughs> scientists here in the group i mean you 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 heard um, iris that um, it's the member states who triggered the european commission and now the research organizations the universities are represented in the general assembly does that appeal to you as a uh, i mean do you feel being represented in in this process as an early career researcher or is it too far from where you are um, so maybe Lydia is actually better equipped to answer this question. I, I took a quick look at the steering board and I think there was also an early career researcher in, in the governing board of Quara. So I think in that sense, yes, there is a representation uh, uh, of an early career researcher. And I think that's, um, yeah, it's, it, that's very important to also have those voices heard because they are going to progress, progress in academia and hopefully actually benefit from Quara when it comes to researcher assessment. Lydia, uh, you know, I'm, as you know, I'm involved in the European Open Science Cloud Association and we often discuss, okay, all what we are doing is just taking place in uh, our bubble and only the people who are in that bubble know what we are talking about. Um, um, well, I, I, well, one could fear, <laughs> let me put it this way, that exactly the same happens with, uh, with Quara what are your counter mechanisms, countermeasures to avoid that, you know, just uh, the discussion takes place in the bubble? Yes, thank you for the question. Well, indeed, um, I in the steering board, that, that is, uh, that's a little bit complex, but uh, the, the methodology to, to choose this, to select the steering board, but this is precisely why it's complicated, because we want to ensure that there is a little bit of a representation of all uh, research organizations, including, of course, young researchers. Second, the, um, <laughs> in the discussion to the steering board, we all remind each other almost uh, every hour that young researchers have to be part of the process. So, and as I said, this has been uh, firmly included in the call for working groups that they must, is a must, it's not an option uh, not to include young researchers. So mm, they may not be today super involved because the working groups have not yet, uh, are not yet out there working but they will have to be involved once the working groups are uh, appointed. And that's one thing. Then uh, uh, I fully understand, Klaus, your comment on uh, to, to risk to being in a bubble. We put a special attention in that this doesn't happen by, um, you, we, you know, yes, we have that uh, young researcher, Yancy Flores, but we also have Thomas Susi, who is not so young, but still young, academic, uh, and, and they hammer us as well, uh, the older generation, with, uh, <laughs> with all the um, connection with reality, connection with the scientific community, and connection with young researchers. So we are all super aware of that, all in the, in the steering board. So... 
we we are it's difficult that we are going to forget that because we are constantly reminding ourselves yeah. and then uh, to avoid uh, disconnecting ourselves from from content we ourselves we are going to assess the working group proposals okay. with all due confidentiality um sorry conf confidentiality of course but um conflicts of interest for example i am not going to assess any working groups that have one mm. science europe member for okay. example okay you see uh, and so we have some mechanisms like okay. this how is the attention among the publishers, um, uh, Ian? Is that an issue which is currently being discussed among the publishers, that Quora is there, how to push position to, to this initiative? Um, um, maybe you can uh, share with us your experiences from the publisher's perspective. Uh, sure, I, I can briefly. Um, I think what, what I would say candidly is that I acknowledge that scholarly publishers or, or certain or perhaps all scholarly publishers may be seen as more part of the problem than the solution in, in research assessment. So I, I want to be honest about that. And that's another reason why I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion. Um, and I, I, am, I am curious about um, the extent to which publishers can or should or how they should engage um, with Kawara, because I think there are of course, implications for, for publishers with, with research assessment reform, um, but also an awful lot of opportunities as, as well in terms of what publishers can do to support the discovery and advancement of, of research. Ultimately, if we take a step back from journals and articles and sort of the mechanics of of some of the the outputs um, of of, um, of publishing activities, if we're really trying to support the advancement of research, then we have to think about well, what is the best way to to enable that as as publishers. And I think if one outcome, one potential outcome of um, what Kawara is trying to achieve is, for example, more of a focus on diverse research outputs, then I think there are numerous opportunities there for publishers to think about well, what is the right way to add value to uh, the scholarly record, whether that's through better surfacing or discovery of things like data and code, mm -hmm. whether it's about providing different ways of signaling um, or assessing the quality of different outputs. Um, I think it's very exciting. Um, but but yes, I, I think certainly one that um, I would I would advocate that the publishers could could be part of the solution as well. Uh, Claudia, can you share with us uh, how it, uh, this topic is being discussed among uh, the research performing organizations, for example, uh, with the, um, within Germany, with all the other extra university research organizations, DFG, um, um, universities and uh, organizations like that. Is that, uh, did it receive much attention? Is it really a topic or um, what is your impression? Mm. <coughs> yeah, thank you for this question. I think, yes, it is a topic. It is a controversial, still a controversial topic mm -hmm. within Germany, because um, in Germany uh, we have the approach that uh, science, uh, that research assessment must always be science driven. And so I think um, in the very beginning of this process, there was a fear of uh, being dominated by politics, especially EU politics uh, in this regard. And that the process, the research assessment is something which could be taken out of the hands of scientists. So yes, there was um, much reluctance and skepticism mm -hmm. towards the process. I think that to some extent, um, Quora, Quora and the, the overall process has proven that this danger does not exist. Uh, because uh, some big organizations in Germany are members of Quara, such as the DFG mm. and also our organization, the Leibniz Association. Um, I think there's still room for improvement. Um, 
And, but I also think that has something to do intrinsically with the history of Germany, uh, reluctance to an overtake by, by policy. And I think within the process, within the reform process, this is also something that has been, has to be taken very much into account that we all, we all come from different cultural backgrounds with different historical backgrounds, which have shaped our, uh, our research uh, science systems and also the way in which we are assessing research and we have to keep this in mind because yeah because it's it's very important so discussions are un are very different uh, there is much approval the dfg is very much behind it and the leibniz association as well um, but i think yes there could still be some other big organizations who could join uh, the movement um, uh as uh, Lydia um, uh, mentioned in her um, uh, impulse statement, uh, we want to get rid of quantitative indicators and want to replace them by qualitative um, uh, like indicators or, or measures. Discussions I attended uh, were uh, heavily concerned who should you know, do the qualitative um, assessment of the scientific output. Is it again us, the scientists, or um, uh, who, yeah, who, who should do that? So far, the quantitative system, you know, the advantage is you can just count citations <laughs> you can, uh, and, and then you have a number and that number kind of indicates, okay, this uh, researcher is a high profile researcher, that one not so much. Um, uh, what is, uh, how is that topic uh, being discussed in Quara? Well, the, um, the way the topic has been discussed in Quara is, um, uh, again, dates back maybe from, from the General Assemblies, uh, the previous ones, because they were more into what, what, is, what system we want more than what system we have. And uh, yes, of course, the, the current system has the beauty that is simple, if you like. Uh, or at least it simplifies, but precisely because it's simple, because it oversimplifies the situation today, is why this uh, system is now reaching its limit and a change is needed. Mm -hmm. Now, fully understand that this opens up questions uh, as to will the quality be less? Will, uh, will this be moving away from scientists? Well, the answer is neither quality should be compromised, neither the process of assessment should be moved away from scientists. That's mm. absolutely uh, a must. The peer review, despite the defects that some insist in, in providing, it's a good system because, of course, it's among peers. Mm. So th that is not put into question on Quara. What is put into, more into question is what we how we can evolve from here in a, in a coordinated way because research is about collaboration and, and about uh, coordination. What we need to do um, in speaking in very general terms, and that's why the working groups are there for, is to develop some tests, um, defining new ways of assessing. We're not starting from zero. There are very good examples in the Netherlands, in Ireland, in Luxembourg, in Germany as well, that are already um, using what is called the narrative CV or some other variations of the narrative CV, where there are uh, narratives that exemplify whether a researcher is of high quality or not. In fact, um, and I'm sure you know that, the social scientists, for example, they are much less reliant on journal impact factors because mm. they have other type of, of outcomes, of products, if we call talking market um, terms. Yet there are elements of rigor in those analyses. So mm. we, we, we should perhaps also learn from the social sciences and humanity and, and see how they have included these elements of rigor in processes that up until now has been largely quantitative. Mm. It's, 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 a, it's a whole exploration, but as I said, we're not starting from zero, and there are already pilots demonstrating mm. that the acceptance by researchers mm. is as high as in the current system, at least. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I think um, Aquora is also about um, uh, acknowledging other scientific outcomes uh, in addition to the publication. 
Um, Iris, a uh, question to you. I mean, you are here in the panel. Do you have a feeling that um, like your presence, your involvement in this panel gets um, uh, acknowledged by your institution? Is that something uh, which is um, like which, uh, which you can benefit from? Or is it just a voluntary contribution which takes some time which you otherwise could spend on your PhD thesis? That, that's a good question. I mean, I was asked for the to join the panel like quite short notice. <laughs> so uh, I didn't consult with, say, my colleagues or supervisors. Mm -hmm. This would contribute to my PhD. But I think being part of a panel um, brings experience and that is important for a PhD. But mm -hmm. if you talk about formal recognition and contribution, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think you can put it on your um, research portal. Uh, sites. Mm. But then again, will this progress uh, my career? Uh, I, th I think it does. I think these, uh, this is very important uh, to, to be a part of. Um, but on the long run, yeah, I don't know if it's not recognized, then, then why do all these talks voluntary? Mm. I think this also goes for everybody in this panel. Like We are here for to, to share knowledge and to engage in this important debate. Um, but how, yeah, how do our institutions recognize these um, these talks? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I would like to invite our audience to also pose their questions on Slido. Um, and indeed, I have one already. Let me just um, check this one. It will now come on the screen, I think. Yeah. Um, how to move forward when many universities still care about university ranking systems uh, such as QS, the which are still very focused on quantitative measures. Um, so who, who has an answer to that? Oh, Iris, please go ahead. I don't know if I have an answer, but I also was actually wondering about this question because yes. I think I, f I foresee a tension. Because uh, as stated in the core commitments, the fourth one is to, to avoid the use of rankings of research organizations and research assessments. But then if universities still use these rankings, for example, to recruit students, which is not research based anymore. So there's, there's going to be a tension between, for mm. example, uh, the Netherlands, if they say we're not going to do research assessment anymore in this quantitative way, but in a qualitative way instead, they're going to drop in these rankings. And I foresee that they're still going to find the rankings important precisely for student recruitment. Um, so moving forward, I, I think then we also need to think about mm. different ways of looking. What do we see as a good university? And then thinking about these things like researcher assessment or, f for example, how well universities are doing with regards to uh, research integrity rather than these quantitative uh, indicators. Anyone else from uh, the panel who wants to answer uh, this question or uh, yeah, Lydia, please. Uh, maybe to say that, that 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 in fact that commitment came precisely from the university sector. <laughs> so, so that reflects perhaps a contradiction within the university sector. <laughs> Uh, and uh, also, but it came as very strong, eh? uh, so that's why it was it was put as a as a as a one of the most uh, important mm. commitments. And this, in fact, it has been reflected in in the uh, proposal for working groups that we have received, because there are several very in in good uh, proposals for universities to look uh, more deeply into that. So we don't have an answer now, Klaus. But <laughs> we don't you're have working an answer on for it. The, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but surely uh, that that will be one of the lines of action. Yes. Okay. Very good. So Quara, and this is a question for Ian as um, a representative of the publishers, is um, also thinking about accepting uh, um, other scientific outcomes than just a publication. For example, in the Leibniz Association, we get evaluated every seven years. So far, um, we had to uh, um, provide the 10 most important publications. This has been um, uh, now changed. Um, in addition to the 10 most important publications, we should also provide the most important, 10 most important or outcomes of the institutions. Um, for example, in my case, it would be 18 million downloads of digital full texts. That would be our contribution to the system. The question is, um, how do the publishers react on the fact that more and more like alternatives to the publication 
uh, will um, um, become uh, like an important part of the science system, like um, science policy papers, like um, software code, research data was um, heavily discussed during this conference. Are you thinking about extending your um, service profile in that direction? So I think there have been different strategies that, that publishers have been deploying. Um, I'll perhaps give a couple of examples. Um, so I'm not merely focused on perhaps what we're thinking about at PLOS, but um, one, one strategy that I've observed is that um, there has been a growth of journals or publication platforms for these non-traditional outputs. Mm. Um, we have things like data papers and software papers, which in principle are helping to surface, um, provide quality control, increase the discoverability of other research outputs. However, I do think that there's also a risk there that we're assuming that everything must fit into an article shaped box, that it must feel and look and behave like a journal article, which I think mm -hmm. could have some unintended consequences if that's assumed to be the, the main or the only solution to this problem. So in fact, I think that what we should be thinking more about, and, and certainly we're thinking more about this at PLOS, is not assuming that, that always the article is the unit of credit. Um, and in fact, that researchers use all kinds of tools and mechanisms for creating, discovering and sharing research. And I feel it should be more the publisher to think about the job of, well, how do we surface and connect uh, and offer some kind of, um, filter or curation for content for the relevant or specific research communities that we serve. Um, so that might more practically be more things about how we link content together, how we package content together in a way that makes sense for a particular reader or, or, mm. or a particular user. Um, very specific example, an experiment that we're, that we're running at the moment at PLOS. Um, for papers that we publish where the author has deposited code or data in a repository, we have an automated process that will put a very prominent badge on that article, which does two things. Uh, the first, it's intended to reward that more open practice, but secondly, and more importantly, it, it actually helps the discovery of those other outputs as well. Um, and we're hoping to learn what the, what the, the reader, what the user behavior is and, and what that tells us about which outputs are, are valuable or not. Because I think that also is another challenge for publishers. Obviously, there are millions of papers in the world. There's probably many more millions of these other kinds of outputs. Um, so there is a, a question about, well, which are the ones that are um, most important, most valuable to the particular research communities the particular publisher serves? But I think that's a very interesting problem to try and solve. <laughs> We have another question from the audience, and let me see which one is. No, that we already. No, it's a new one. It just it's a new one. It's there. Um, does Quora have any plans to engage university ranking systems, which are still looking at citation counts, proportion of publications in top journals? I think that is related to the previous questions we had. Um, um, and but uh, it's maybe a little bit more specific because um, and and I would like Lydia if you can reflect on it. Well, I I really <laughs> don't know how to answer this question. It's very difficult for me uh, yes, because yeah. we have not had a discussion in the steering board about the test, okay. and this is in the framework of the working group uh, that will look into that. So I'm sorry, but I can't. It's it's an early it's question. <laughs> it's too uh, too much of an enough. early question. Um, I, I come back to what Ian just um, uh, um, uh, explained to us, the experiments they are conducting at PLOS. Um, uh, Iris, um, uh, from your perspective as early career scientists, uh, does, is that what you need? I mean, it, you know, in addition to the publication, which gives credit um, to you, as a PhD student, in addition uh, to also to the PhD thesis, what do you need um, uh, for support, for infrastructure support, for your for publishing your scientific outcomes? Well, I mean, this is this is also the Open Science Conference, and I think linking it, linking research assessment and open science together, I think that's one important aspect. So now, if I 
So I'm a qualitative researcher, so a lot of effort and also questions go into how do I share my data in an in in open and accessible way. Um, and a lot of effort and time goes into making all my data sets and, and, and my research uh, available in, in my case mm -hmm. on the open science framework, but I do not get recognized for that. Uh, and so I, I guess the question is, how can that be combined? And then also what roles indeed do, uh, do journals play? And that is an article indeed the only way that research can be presented? Or are there also uh, other ways in which researchers might be um, valued for their for their work? Um, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. one other maybe, maybe one other aspect in the Netherlands, it's common to have your dissertation as a book. So I think this is most places, of course, but then this will also always be a journal or chapter like style. So maybe there, there is another way to um, finish your PhD with, for example, more living content or mm. data sets included. That, that, that's something I, I would think about. I know of one uh, PhD thesis uh, published in Germany in a wiki. So that was not a book. It was, um, uh, you know, a living kind of living document, of course, at the um, time the PhD thesis was submitted, it was frozen because that was the reference for the evaluators. Um, I, I very much liked um, uh, what Ian said about the packages which are needed from the uh, scientists and that uh, such packages um, of course includes the analysis, um, um, the, the explanation of the scientific outcomes plus additional um, elements, for example data, research, uh, software. And um, here the question to, to Claudia is, is that also being discussed among the research institutions to what extent, you know, beyond the article, um, uh, research um, outcomes can be uh, packaged? Um, I'm asking the question because in the uh, um, panels you are and, and the Leibniz Association is represented, you know, we have uh, many researchers and, uh, you know, scientists um, uh, which started their career several years ago, <laughs> if not even decades ago. So could you provide us with uh, some insights on, uh, on how the discussions are um, going there? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as far as I know, within Leibniz, yes, there are different approaches or different considerations uh, about these packages, as you as you call them. Um, first, we you know maybe that we have a steering group on scientific publishing within the Leibniz Association, so that really deals with the question of of, of publishing. Um, but we also have an initiative op on uh, open science, so which is the transfer of, uh, of sorry of um, um, citizen science, which is the transfer of research. Um, uh, into, si into society and the connection with society. So this is also part of, of, um, re of outputs of research. And then there's also the fact of communication. You know that for the Leibniz Association, one very important pillar is uh, policy advice. So mm -hmm. how do you transfer uh, your research uh, findings into, into policy? How, how, how do you organize this advice? So, and this is, the problem is that this is exactly, I mean, this is exactly what the reform process is about. Um, considering other aspects such as uh, publications and uh, making available research data, but also uh, maybe a broader defi definition of what a researcher is and of what research is. It's not only, and that is the, I think that is the, the, the focus and the, the the core element of this of, of the research assessment process is to say and to, to accept that research and a researcher there's more about uh, more to it than only only I'm sorry only research but it's also the way you are communicating your research mm. how you're leading your teams how you're engaging with society mm. and with politics and I think one of the challenges ahead of of the reform process is to well to to come to an agreement of this kind of uh, definition broader definition and um, to avoid or to 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 communicate to everybody mm. that it has nothing to do with diluting 
the principle of excellence. Mm. It is not something which should replace the principle of excellence, but it's rather the idea of having excellence everywhere, but to consider a broader, a broader picture, a broader type of researcher. Thank you very much, Claudia. There is a question for you from the audience, which I would like to share with you all. Just a second. It should now be bis displayed there. Oh, that's and that is the one I was um, looking for. Um, I have a question for Claudia. Um, what would you say about what the signing of the agreement has initiated within an organization such as the Leibniz Association? What is the impact of the signature? Yes, thank you for the for the question. It's it's for me. It's really very interesting to to observe this process within the Leibniz Association, and I can I. I think I can say that from <clears throat> from the early beginning um, of this initiative, there was some kind of skepticism, as I already stated in the beginning of this discussion. And now I can see there is widely approval of this process and the wish to actively um, shape the process, shape the, the reform process. And concretely, uh, well, first of all, we have a president who is very much committed to, to research assessment, who really wants to support it and whose decision it was in the end to, to join Quara. And we have different groups already. I mean, Quara is a train we are jumping on. It is not like the Leibniz Association starts from scratch. We have been committed to, we have, we have signed the Berlin Declaration in 2003. Uh, we have been committed to open science, to open data. Klaus, I don't have to tell you, you were what, the initiator of all this process back in, I think, 2010 already, and you were very active 2013 with the start of open research data at the EU level. So we have a lot of ongoing initiatives already. And now what Quara did with, does with us is that we are going to we are going to implement it in a more structured way. We are thinking about what is ongoing, what is we 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 are just about to have a kind of a, um, taking stock of what exists already at Leibniz. And then one important issue is also that we have two evaluation uh, processes within Leibniz. One is the competitive um, evaluation process as regards um, project funding within the Leibniz Association. And we have there, um, an, uh, we have an evaluation system with its indicators and rules. And this is certainly something which we ha will have to look in as well as well. It is a system that is is being evaluated regularly as well. But now related to Quora, we have maybe, I don't know if I can say a more active or a more, uh, yeah, a more awareness, aware mm. look into this. We also have the, as you said man, before Klaus, the evaluation of our institutes. So it will of course affect also our institutional uh, evaluation. And last but not least, I would like to say that um, as regards the action plan, the members of Quara will have to implement. We are in uh, we are in the course of planning an internal leaders workshop, the Führungskolleg, mm. which will take place this autumn. And this colleague addresses the directors of our institutes. We invited also external speakers, and it will be about. Um, as I said about stock taking, what do we have already? Where are we? What is our starting point? Where are our challenges? What has to be changed? What can be changed? And it is for us like a, as a kind of a kickoff event to start our own internal action plan. Thank you. And can we leave this question? Uh, because I also wanted to ask Ian, what has the signing of the agreement initiated within PLOS? The, I mean, a number of the principles uh, set out in Kawara are, are things that we're, we're we're very much interested in already. Um, I think particularly relevant at the moment, we've actually been undertaking some original research, looking at more the process of research assessment, um, because like others, you know, we're we're concerned about the the dominance of the general impact factor and how research quality is is, is assessed in different contexts. Um, 
So if you if you um, permit me a minute, I'll just give you a bit of context as to as, as to the questions we were asking and, and and what we found because we've just actually put put some results out as a poster um, uh, for a conference that's happening later this year. Um, so we were really curious um, what exactly how is it that researchers are, are assessing the quality and the impact of research when they're performing grant review or if they're on a hiring committee? We found lots of interesting things, but, but some key points um, are that, um, firstly, researchers are interested in looking at multiple research outputs. Um, they're equally interested in trying to understand credibility and trustworthiness of research as well as impact. But the problem seems to be, or this research involving biology research, as I should point out, about, about 485 respondents, is that with the tools that are currently available to researchers in these contexts, so in, in committee in, in committee contexts, um, they find it very difficult to be able to judge quality and credibility of research in those time-constrained environments. And, and one side effect of that is is that they they may have to rely on less suitable proxies for credibility such as unfortunately the journal impact factor so i think that um as well as thinking about um what this means for policies and, and organizational culture and structure i think we also have to think about what are the tools that researchers that are in these settings need in order to to implement some of the some of these mm. principles how do we provide equally convenient, but better signals of, of quality and credibility, taking into account those kinds of environments and, and, and what researchers are trying to achieve in, in, in those contexts. So um, I perhaps drifted a bit, a bit from your original question, but I do think that um, there is a real implementation challenge here, which, which, which I think is solvable. But um, sort of thinking about what research is really trying to do to understand research integrity or quality, um, or those other aspects um, about what may, might help us understand um, research quality or impact, that that there is that there is perhaps a lack of suitable tools to be able to do that um, in a way I think that we would all like to see in the future. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, are you already at the point that your members are asking you, well, what is um, our value? being member of uh, the uh, Quora um, initiative. S have you had uh, such discussions? Uh, because that is also related to the what the signing has initiated. If there's nothing, the members might start asking, well, uh, why should I s remain a member in these organizations? Yes, well, of course, you're right. Um, well, the value of Quora will have to prove itself. It has proved uh, so far, because uh, what we can see for now is that the number of uh, members are is increasing. Uh, we were shortly above uh, 400 when when we launched Quora, and we are above 500 now. Hmm. So in six months, there's 100 more members. And uh, well, what we hope is that the, the organization will serve the purpose for which it was created, which is is, is a a place to discuss, to meet, to share, to learn, to advance, uh, to assess, and to prepare, and to discuss, and to bring in the, the, the problems in, acad in the academic sector, in the research sector. So, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I do hope that we, we from the steering board, uh, we are determined uh, that this is, is the major objective of us, is to to be that platform that is respectful, as I said at the beginning of my talk, with the autonomy of the institutions, but at the same time with a forward look. Um, so I understand what Ian just said about, of course, the limitations of sometimes uh, very tight times and, and schedules to, to assess. And yes, it is a challenge, but mm. we need to see whether there are better systems that can give a, a, a better way uh, to, to assess in a short time, yet be more faithful to this new way of taking into account the outputs of research. Then is when Koara will really have okay. proved its existence. There is another question from the audience, uh, which I think is for you, Lydia. I have selected it now. Uh, and it should appear on the screen. Yeah, Lydia, what if 
any attempts are made to include other parts of the world in changing assessment practices? Yes, indeed. As I said, we have a program for that. We are developing a strategy. One of the uh, specific measures we uh, did in May, it was in the framework of the meeting of the Global Research Council, which took place in the Hague. Uh, at the beginning, at the end of May, sorry, end of May, beginning of June, was to organize a special session uh, with uh, research councils from all over the world. We had people from Asia, Latin America, North America, Africa, Middle East, all parts of the world. And uh, men, we received there the, um, how can I say, the worry or concern that this was a European uh, initiative. So we tried to do our best that, yes, of course, that's something that has been born in Europe. We can't deny that. At the same time, this is also born with a very uh, intense uh, desire that this is not a European uh, initiative. So we started with the Global Research Council, but we are appealing now all working groups to include at least one other organization from a non-European, from the non-European region. Mm. Uh, we plan to have at least one member of each of the big European regions by the end of 2023. And then we will set up our, for ourselves some targets as well to include members uh, from other regions. We are in conversations with Japan. We are in conversations with India. So we are, we are using all the network of contacts that we can use uh, to enlarge. We are in conversations with USA, by the way. They have declared this the year of open science. I'm sure you know that. And uh, they are also uh, starting to understand what Koara is. The Canadians are also trying to understand what Koara did. Latin America, I don't know if you saw it, they did uh, a mini Koara because they, not so long ago, they also issued um, a statement on research assessment, which in fact, in essence, is very similar to that of Koara. So we have, uh, we are in touch with them and, and we hope that this will give the fruits that we expect to make Koara a truly international organization. There is another question related to uh, um, organizations who have not yet joined Koara, and I want to display that one. Um, there it is. Um, what arguments do those organizations put forward that have deliberately not joined Koara? What is holding them back? Maybe Claudia, do, do you know um, uh, from other like German or European research organizations who have not yet joined Quora and why they have not yet joined? Yes, uh, yes, I know about organizations that have not yet joined. And I think um, it has to do with something that I mentioned before. Uh, it is the fear, the scepticism of a process that is European policy driven and that is not under control of the scientific community anymore. Mm. That is one argument. Uh, the other argument is that there is a fear of diluting the excellence principles, that if we start to consider other um, aspects uh, of, uh, an excellent, of a, a research career or of good research, excellent research, if we start to consider um, aspects such as yeah, communicating with the broader public and uh, transfer into, into policy. That is something that for some uh, organizations is maybe not acceptable because then yeah, it, it would dilute the, the excellence principles. This is, I think, the main arguments I've heard uh, against mm. joining Quara. Okay, can you confirm that, Lydia? Is that also your impression? I Yes, that's one, uh, indeed, uh, as, as I also said. And there is another one, which is, um, well, in Latin America, you've, you, you've seen this, this statement that this kind of similar quarter, but in Asia, Africa, Middle East, they are not used to have this level of a structured dialogue that we have in Europe. So then when they ask, if they ask to the neighbors, the neighbors don't know either. So then they, they do not feed positively each other, rather negatively you say, well, if you don't do it, I don't do it either. So there is also a, a, a dynamic to be created in all these regions as well, to get into uh, in contact 
between themselves as well. And that's something that we see in the Global Research Council more and more as well. In the last remaining minutes I would like to spend on the relationship between Quara and uh, the Open Science Movement. And in order to open the discussion on that, I uh, want to share with you the following uh, question um, from the audience. Uh, chicken and egg problem. Is there a need for more transparency due to the problematic practices in research assessment or is open science the driver to reform research assessment? So, who has an opinion on that? <laughs> Claudia, please go ahead. And then Lydia, of course. Uh, yeah. I think, um, well, I just would like to repeat, I, I, I think I mentioned it in the very beginning, that it all started with council conclusions from the member states who asked for the reform process in relation to open science. So actually, to answer this question, yes, open science was and is a little bit the driver for research assessment. Um, so, so I think I think that even if the the reform process addresses a broader um, a broader range of aspects to be considered, open science is, science is definitely one of the core elements of this reform process. Lydia, I think you support that. If I remember your uh, initial presentation correctly. Yes, yes, uh, totally. Open science is not the driver, but it's certainly one of the major drivers because that's the direction where we are all going. Yes. Well, uh, um, on the other hand, I mean, all what you have mentioned, uh, Lydia, uh, could also take place without um, uh, the open science movement. Like, for example, um, uh, publishing research data, publishing a source code uh, that could also be behind a, a paywall and not necessarily open. And still you would be uh, in line with the uh, principles of the uh, of, of Quara, right? So where is really the um, uh, or how is uh, Quara pushing um, open science? Um, uh, Ian, please, you raise your hand. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt if, if there was another response. Ju was just jump in, it's fine, it's fine. Um, I, I was looking at this question a little bit differently. I agree there is a circular issue here. Is open science driving research assessment reform? Is research assessment reform driving open science? But I think both of those things, open science and research assessment reform, are a means to an end. They're not what we're trying to achieve. They're both means to better research. Um, whether or not one comes first, I don't know if I have the answer, but I think it's it's worth thinking about the what I see as um, a more ultimate goal is, um, is, is, is a better system, a better culture of research. And I think both of those elements are important parts of achieving that. Lydia? Yeah, sure. I, I agree. Okay. I agree. Uh, the driver, uh, there are several drivers for the ultimate goal, to which is that research should be better assessed. Uh, sorry, uh, I interrupted you. To what extent is um, open science uh, really an issue, for example, in the general assemblies? To what extent do you reach out to the open science community? I'm asking because here we have the uh, open science activists involved. And how can they get involved? Of, co of course, they can become a member. But at this uh, point in time, how is open science being discussed in the different working groups you mentioned in the General Assembly? Is that uh, like present all the time or is it just something which is, you know, implicitly in the heads of the people? <laughs> That's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky question. Uh, because the General Assembly, after the creation of Quora, has been only one, and, and it's been largely driven up for uh, uh, providing information uh, and generate the working groups, etc. But what it is true is that is a mainstream for us. It's like uh, young researchers, right? involving young researchers thinking mm -hmm. about open science. These are mainstream um, lines in all activities. Of course, as we said before, not a reform of research assessment doesn't necessarily lead us to open science or it, it, it can be done without science being open that's a fact but we think that both, both movements feed each other claudia first and then uh, iris um claudia 
Yeah, I remember that in the upsetting process of um, of Quara, with the many stakeholder workshops we were having, there were so many re re researchers participating, over 400 and so, and uh, open science was an issue, was absolutely and definitely an issue there. And I couldn't, I, I would be surprised that, to hear that, uh, that they're not yet involved in the process. Um, and I also think that um, at least one of the Quora working groups is going to deal with the issue of open science, uh, be it directly as, as a core element of a working group or, or an element of one of the working groups. So I think that that is something which, which will be looked at into. And also I think that it is one of the roles of the steering board to make sure that nobody will be left behind and that the issue of open science, I remember, uh, council conclusions, uh, will be addressed properly. And then finally, I think that all the Quora members and their institutions, like the Leibniz Association, will have to make sure that in their individual action plans, open science is being properly addressed and um, communicated back to uh, Quora and the steering board. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Claudia. Iris, you also raised your hand. Yeah, so also what, what I really liked Ian's point that um, open science and research assessment work together to improve research uh, quality. But I think it also is about research equality in the sense that, for example, uh, lowering inequalities, for example, gender gaps, we saw a talk about that, or north-south collaborations mm. that both research assessment and open science can actually help in lowering these kinds of existing inequalities in academia and make it a more level and a fair playing field. Thank you very much. I fully agree here. Um, I wanted to ask you if, um, before I come to the closing question to all, I, uh, in your uh, um, opinion, is there something missing we could you know, include into Quara to uh, even push more the open science movement. Uh, so what can we, what can our community do uh, to, uh, um, uh, you know, make open science more visible in that community? Um, again, uh, uh, to me, Quora could also take place without any open science thoughts. Everything, you know, we, we could measure or we could introduce other um, scientific packages which are closed. And um, how can we bring in our thoughts from our community here? L Lydia, you raise your hand and then Claudia. Yes, thank you for the question. Well, I think that um, the community of um, open science uh, <laughs> advocates, um, it's very welcome in Quara. Uh, the working groups that are going to be uh, generated now are open. That is also a condition, but the working groups remain open. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest is that any of the community of open science advocates uh, first of all, to check if their organization is already engaged and then uh, contact the, the person, the main contact person, to make sure that their voice is included. If they don't see that their institution is engaged, promote that engagement and uh, ask this organization to be part of the most relevant working group that they can think of. So engaging mm, in engaged. existing initiatives. Engaging is for yeah. free. Uh, open, so there are no restrictions on, on that. Working groups are obliged to accept members. <laughs> There's no question. Claudia, you also raised your hand. Yeah, it has also to do with something with that uh, that uh, Lydia just mentioned, the engaging aspect. And I would um, place this in the context of the different um, national and especially European in initiatives that are already ongoing. Because we have, and Klaus, you mentioned it uh, at the beginning, we have the European Open Science Cloud activity, the various activities in this field. And we also have the European Commission's platform Open Research Europe. Uh, we also have national activities, as for instance in Germany, the National Research Data Infrastructure. And I think that the, the crucial point here will be to think and to bring all these different 
uh, initiatives at the different levels together mm. to bring the stakeholders together. So it's one thing, Quara and the working groups, but there are other initiatives out there, national, European, and we will have to think them together. And also what Lydia just said, yes, reach out to the working groups, but I think one important role of the steering committee will also, to be, will also be to think of a way to integrate all those who are not active members of any working group, because there is really a will out there of forming this process. I can, I could see it really at every event I went, I went to in this regard, and the community is really keen on doing something, on advancing. And I am especially looking at Iris at the younger, younger generation, and it would be a pity to to miss this momentum. Thank you very much. We come to the um, uh, closing questions to all and I would like you to give a personal statement. What is your uh, personal expectation or recommendations for the future? And maybe uh, I, Ian, you want to start and then Iris, then Claudia and the final word is with Lydia. Uh, okay, so I have three thoughts broadly, and they're quite biased by this research that we've been doing very recently. So that, that's a caveat with, with, with what I'm about to say. Um, but I do think um, in terms of suggestions, recommendations for the future, that um, really thinking about the researcher in, 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 in this situation and how so much of this is dependent on the researcher in terms of producing the outputs, reviewing the outputs um, in those different contexts. And I do think we need to um, understand those needs and and I think there's an opportunity to provide better solutions, better tools for researchers that are involved in assessing research. Um, but then thinking about publishers, we clearly need to do more to enable the discovery and assessment of those more diverse outputs and enable quality to be judged in 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 more diverse ways. And and finally, um, I do think there's an opportunity for organizational policies and guidelines. And by organizations, I mean institutions, funders and journals. I think often we're too overly focused on impact and novelty um, in those guidelines and policies. And I think um, reform of, of those will also support what we're trying to achieve here, including greater adoption of open science practices. Thank you very much. Iris, what is your personal statement, your expectations, your recommendations? Um, so, so a while ago, I, I attended the Recognition and Rewards Festival in, in the Netherlands, which was about research assessment. And there, one person said that we've been having the conversation for, for 10 years now about research assessment, researcher assessment, uh, but the ball is rolling very slowly. So my hope would be, for, for speaking as an early career researcher, that the ball is going to roll and maybe what open science can also bring to that is be a bit activistic so that we can be activistic in this um, research assessment reform. Thank you very much. Claudia. <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, I have two points to make. One is, I think in this process, it is very, very important not to forget the generation of young researchers who could and should be the winners of a hopefully successfully reformed system. Um, but coming back to Iris, the point that you just you just made, it will take some time, and it will be it will be it will take some time before a new system is being operational. But what does this mean for the young generation of researchers in the meantime? And what criteria should they use to guide their research? And also, which competencies, which aspects will ultimately be decisive for a successful research careers? Um, and I think it is crucial to keep this in mind in all reform considerations in order not to lose a whole generation of young researchers. So that is one point. And the other point is, it's I, again, I come back to, to Iris. My hope is that in this process, um, we all and all the actors involved will not lose their patience and opti optimism, even if it takes a little bit longer. I have been working in the European research uh, policy and funding environment for um, many, many years now, and I could observe and I, I think, Lydia, you could this, do the same, uh, that this boat and this ship is sometimes very slow, but it keeps on going and rolling. So 
don't lose patience. I just, I come back to my point. 20 years have passed since the declaration of Berlin. Uh, it is, it was a very long time. It's a long time, but then a lot has happened too. And here we are taking another important step. And I just believe that anyway, we cannot turn the wheel back. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And the final word is uh, with Lydia. What are your personal Thank expectations, you. recommendations for this important initiative? Thank you, Klaus. Well, um, my expectation is that um, the reform of research assessment systems becomes truly global, and that when we speak about we speak about the global giant. Uh, young generation, because that means uh, people with a lot of untapped potential in very deprived countries in the world, in very deprived areas who don't have access to education. And we must provide also the means for these people to get to education. Their brains are brilliant as they are in other parts in the world. That's not a prerogative of any country or area. So I think that um, uh, Kuara can spark a movement of diversity uh, in uh, research by bringing also together the young, the young generation on board. And I hope that this becomes a reality. Maybe I'm a little bit of a daydreamer, but uh, I think that uh, it can help that big movement. Thank you very much. Um, we are now at the end of uh, this panel. I would very much like to thank the four panelists for their contributions. During the last one and a half hours, I would like to thank the participants and I apologize that I could not take all the questions we received from the auditorium. Um, and uh, well, we will closely follow the progress of uh, the Quara initiative. As Klaus Ilya mentioned, these negotiation processes at the European uh, level are not the fastest. Um, within the context of the European Open Science Cloud, we have been discussing the issue since 2015, <laughs> now eight years, and we are still discussing, but there is progress. And the good um, uh, message is uh, this uh, process cannot be stopped once it has uh, started rolling. So we will certainly um, uh, see you all again in uh, the future Open Science Conferences. We will certainly get updates about the progress of Quara in the future Open Science Conferences. Uh, thank you again to all of you. And um, I now come to the closing of uh, the Open Science Conference 2023. Thanks again. We are now at the end of uh, the conference, the 10th uh, conference on open science. And uh, here the background, as you can see, it is the view out of the window. That is where the ZBW is located. Last week we had the Kiel Week, the world's largest sailing event. And then uh, uh, like the Baltic Sea, which you can see in the background, was full of sailing boats. That is a fantastic event. Now everything calmed down. And it's, uh, yeah, as you can see, cloudy at this point in time. I would like to thank all the speakers for their uh, great uh, presentations. I would like to thank the uh, uh, workshop organizers for having organized the workshops, for bringing up topics which are important of importance for this um, conference. Um, also, my thanks go to the participants, to the um, audience who contributed to lively con uh, discussions with their posts, um, with their questions in the interaction tool. And th the program um, of the conference has been uh, uh, put together um, uh, with advice from our international review board. And the lead was among the colleagues of the Leibniz Strategy Forum Open Science. Uh, my great thanks go to all colleagues who were um, active in designing the uh, program of this year's conference. And of course, my um, um, uh, thanks go to the Leibniz Association who financially supported the 10th Open Science Conference. And finally, I would like to thank the event team, all uh, who are on backstage here and in neighbor offices who uh, kept uh, the conference uh, running. Um, thank you to, to, to that team. We hope that we will all see each other again next year. As you uh, have heard in the last panel, the Leibniz Association has an evaluation procedure for scientific excellence of its institutions, its member institutions. And next year, in 2024, the ZBW, our own institution, will has to go through their 
um, evaluation to our evaluation. That evaluation will take place in July, and for this reason we will not have uh, an Open Science Conference in June, for example, because that would uh, heavily interfere with the uh, preparation of our evaluation, and probably we will not have an Open Science Conference in March next year. But we are already um, looking for a good time window in uh, September. Maybe we will co-locate our Open Science Conference with another Open Science event, which is uh, currently being discussed here in Germany. In any case, there will be an 11th Open Science Conference in 2024. Thank you for having been with us for the last three days. I wish you all a great summertime and hopefully see you again next year at our conference. Bye-bye. <laughs>